as Tom said, I kind of work at that intersection between the places where telecom and IT and media touch. But my academic background is in a field called romance philology. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> I grew up overseas, and philology is the study of, of the origins of languages, and romance philology is the study of the origins of romance languages. But the problem is no one's ever heard of philology. You'll notice he didn't say it. And you see, you see I can't tell you how many times I have uh, prepared to do a keynote like this and had somebody come up with my bio, forgetting to remove that part. And they say, and he has a degree from the University of California at Berkeley in romance, and that's where it ends. And, and so a lot of people think I have a degree in romance. I don't. Um, <laughs> I do work in the world of technology. And my clients are all those companies that you all know and love that invent it and create it and figure out ways to monetize it and deploy it around the world. Um, so it would probably disturb them to know that the technology that they do, in fact, invent and deploy and roll out on a regular basis absolutely bores me to tears. I, I really, I'm you know, reading a really cool article about a new technology is kind of like watching paint dry. I just don't care. What I do care about, however, is what do you do with it? How do I take this technology and put it into a place that's never had it before? And how do I now take that technology and use it to do really cool things? Like, let's make healthcare better. Or let's make education more effective. Or let's try to make government more transparent. Or let's improve economies and grow business opportunities. And perhaps most important of all, let's create hope. I believe that creativity and technology and invention and innovation and so on all kind of play a role. But they play a role together. In fact, I'm going to show you this thing which I call the creativity molecule. The creativity molecule to me is sort of this mnemonic, if you will, this visual representation of the coming together of these things. And the reason I want you to look at it is because I'm going to keep coming back to it, but I want you to notice that the top word in the molecule is the word leadership. And I want to tell you why that is. I don't believe anything has a future without it. And I realize that's a very simplistic statement, but let me explain why I say it in the context of this meeting. Leadership to me is a really fundamentally simple thing. And we don't often think about it in the context within which I'm about to present it. So I'm going to do that now, and I want you to think about it throughout everything I'm going to show you today. Leadership to me is really an art form. It's, it's about the ability to create a vision of a desirable future that is so powerful and so compelling that everyone around you looks at your vision and they say, oh, baby, what do I have to do to be part of that? I want to be part. How do I help you achieve that? And they enroll in your mission, which is the mission to create a new status quo. Not the one we have, but the one that we need to have. And if you can create a good enough picture, and if you can present it to people the right way, you can actually do that. What I'm going to present to you right now is a travel log. I'm going to take you on a trip. A trip, a trip through space and time. A trip sort of. <laughs> looking out there at some of the things that I have seen and learned in my work. I, I travel the world. I, I do more than 50 countries a year quite often in the work that I do, much of it in the developing world, as Tom mentioned. And what I want to do is I want to show you that this leadership and creativity linkage is really powerful. And what I really want to demonstrate to you is that every person in this room and everyone that you touch and everyone that you affect and everyone that you speak with really has the opportunity to be the kind of leader that I'm about to describe. I don't think we can succeed or move forward without this, this leadership thing. Leadership has nothing to do with your salary or your title or you know, whether you have a corner office or you have a brass plaque on the door or if you have a door. It's about the ability to create that vision. So let me take you on this journey and let me begin with this gentleman. This is a guy named Almond Stroger. Almond Stroger, 1888 was an undertaker in Kansas City, Missouri. He buried people for a living. And one day, he noticed that his business, well, I was going to say was starting to die, but I'm not going to say that. His business was beginning to decline. And it wasn't because the death rate in Kansas City had dropped off. It had nothing to do with that. It happened that his competitor was married to the town's operator. Okay. Now, this is back in the cordboard days. You remember when you, well, you don't remember, but you had to plug in. You'd call the operator and say, connect me to main 3-7, and you know, the operator would plug in. So 
if a call came in for the undertaker, of course, she didn't connect them to Stroger. She connected them to her husband. And Stroger said, I don't think so. That's just not right. And so he was a bit of a tinkerer and a kind of an inventor, creative dude. And he created the first switch, the first, no joke, the first mechanical switch that has come to be known as the Stroger switch. And it's the device that was first put into place in telephone company networks that allowed a customer to dial and call someone as opposed to having to contact an operator and say, please connect me to so-and-so. Let me put that a slightly different way. It was the first person to put into the hands of the market control over something as technologically advanced as the telephone network. First person to do that. I think that's pretty creative. Let me take Finland was the first country in the world to write into national law that access to broadband is a fundamental basic human right. Estonia followed. The UK and France are writing the legislation as we speak. Nine other countries that I'm aware of are writing similar legislation. Why? Well, it's a very simple thing. It's because these are countries that have come to realize that access to the internet and access to broadband and access to the services that lie beyond the internet are fundamentally and systematically important to the ability of a country today to move forward and to achieve the kinds of things that I talked about a few minutes ago, transparent government, better health care, better education, and so on. This is why we have got to be focused on this stuff, and this is where this technology and this creativity element come together in very, very, very profound ways. You're looking here at the township of Kayelitsa, which is a very large township in southern South Africa, as you can tell from the photograph. It's on the beach. Uh, it's very close to Cape Town. It's the fastest growing township or slum in South Africa. And as you can see, it's you know, not the best of living conditions. I mean, we've got basically little hovels within which multiple people often live. I had the opportunity to visit this township, and what I really want to draw your attention to is not so much the nature of the homes that they're living in. I want to draw your attention to this. Now, when I first saw that dish, I thought, okay, let me get this straight. You have no sewage, you have no running water, you barely have electricity, but you've got cable television. And they said, no, 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 it's not, it's not for television. This is actually so that we can get to the internet. And I said, oh, well, that makes a lot more sense. I mean, you know. They said, well, let us explain to you. Um, actually, before I give you their explanation, let me back up and tell you mine. 1993, uh, a cartoonist by the name of Steiner uh, wrote uh, a little blurb and then put a cartoon in the New Yorker album, or New Yorker magazine, rather. And the, the cartoon, many of you have seen, and it was two dogs, and one of them is sitting at a computer and the other one is watching. And the first dog is typing in the computer. And the dog is saying to the other dog, isn't it great? On the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. <laughs> okay? That, that cartoon has become sort of common fare for those of us that work in the technology world. And, and the reason I think it's so profoundly important here within the context of what I'm talking to you about is the fact that that's how these people live. You see, there's a stigma associated with living in a place like Kayalitsa. If you go to an employer and they ask where you live and you tell them, you won't get the job. You won't get the job because of where you live. It has nothing to do with your skill, your capability, your background, your history. It's all about your location. So I learned that multiple families give up meals several times a week so that they have enough money to collectively pay for access to the internet via satellite so that they can have a website and access to job postings so that they can post their skills and their ability to get hired happens on the basis of who they are, what they're capable of doing, not where they live. Now that to me is pretty important. While I was in, on this particular trip, I also ran into something rather odd. I came around a corner, and I uh, was out in the countryside. This is way up in northern South Africa, and there was a shipping container in, the, in a field. You know, a shipping, you know, one of those big metal 47-foot shipping containers. And it was just sitting in the middle of a lot. But there were people coming in and out of it. Kind of bizarre. So I stopped the car, and I, and I walked over, and I started talking to these folks. Well, it turns out that this, this shipping container 
had been turned into a telephone company central office and a telephone company like public office where you go to pay your bills and buy new phones and so on. And I said, that, that's pretty clever. I said, this had to be kind of expensive. And they said, no, no, it was actually, it was free. I said, free. They said, yeah, it was free. We, we actually got about 800 of these containers and they gave them to us free of charge. I said, okay, you're going to have to explain that one to me. And they said, well, what we did was, we, as we began to build our infrastructure and began to realize how important this was for the little towns and villages in, in the country, we knew that we had to put equipment out there, you know, switches and radios and all the stuff that accompanies a wireless telephone network. And the trouble was that the infrastructure to house the technology was more expensive than the technology itself because they'd have to build buildings and so on. Somebody had a really clever idea. They said, how about those shipping containers? They're made out of steel. You know, they're indestructible. We could put stuff inside them. They're waterproof and they'll, they'll work. So this person went over to uh, the coast, to Durban, city on the coast, and they said, look, we need about 800 of these shipping containers. Went to one of the shipping companies. And we need them dropped in fields and vacant lots all over South Africa, from the, from the Limpopo River all the way down to the coast. And um, we need them sometime in the next six months. Oh, oh and uh, the, the only other thing is we don't want to pay anything for them. <laughs> that was pretty much the reaction of the shipping company. Um, the shipping company said, and this is good for us because, and they said, well, Here's why it's good for you. You see, what we're going to do is we're going to put these things in areas where there is no service. And we're going we're to put them in areas where there are little villages where the people make things, build things, you know, various crafts, carvings, and woven baskets, and so on, that are in high demand among the tourists that come to South Africa. Most of the time, they sell to tourists who get lost and are trying to find their way to Kruger Park, and they pass through the village and see the guy selling the carvings on the side of the road, and they stop and they buy it. But you see, if we give these people internet access, then their market goes from lost tourists on the side of the road to the world. And what's going to end up happening is that they're going to be selling a lot more of the things that they sell, and they're going to be selling them all over the world, and that means they have to be shipped. And the shipping company said, oh yeah, so how many of those did you need and where did you need them? For? And six months later, the network was deployed across the country. That's an extraordinarily creative, creative thing. Now, when I look at this stuff and I kind of take a step back and I try to understand why this technology stuff is so important, I have to kind of think about some of the opportunities I've had in terms of projects to work on. And one of the projects I worked on about a year ago was a project that was done through a couple of technology companies and the World Economic Forum and UNESCO and a few others. And what we did was we basically looked at the bottom of the pyramid countries. These are the countries whose economies are just now getting to a point where they're generating enough revenue, enough income, enough success economically, that they're starting to have an impact on the global economy. They're not quite there yet, but they're getting there. These are countries like Ghana, and countries like Myanmar, and countries like Bangladesh, and so on. And we talked to people in all these countries, and we got a chance to really see firsthand what happens when we hand you a mobile phone for the very first time. And here's what we learned. We learned that if you go into one of these bottom of the pyramid countries and you give people a phone, which by the way today, based on existing technology, we can do for about a dollar a person. A dollar. I can give them a phone. No broadband, no internet access, just texting and voice. If I can raise mobile penetration in the bottom of the pyramid countries by as little as 10%, here's the impact. I can raise the gross domestic product in that country by 1% because I give them a cell phone. That translates into about $160 billion a year in terms of, X of increase in global economy. It translates into almost half a million kids in each country that get an education otherwise wouldn't have one. And staggeringly translates into an increase in life expectancy of 15 months because we gave them a cell phone. Now, that's kind of cool. And when we start to look at the impact of that, and we start to realize that this is much more than you know, tweeting that you're sitting on the, on the porch, we start to see that this technology stuff, when it's put into the hands of people that have the ability to look at it and say, I can use this to change my life, things start to happen. We met a group of women in Western Ghana who were healthcare providers. They were healthcare providers who were, who were trying to reduce the infant mortality rate in Western Ghana because of really educational issues. And what they did was they started sending text messages to young women who were expecting their first babies. 
here's what to expect, here's what's going to happen, here's what happens in the final trimester, here's what you need to do after the birth to make sure that you avoid infection and so on. And by texting these messages to these young women, they reduced the infant mortality rate in Western Ghana by 80% because we gave them a cell phone. How about education? How about health care? How about transparent government? To me, this is really what it's about. Technology in and of itself, it's like a screwdriver. But when it's applied properly, the results are extraordinary. I was in Mobile World Congress in Barcelona two years ago. As you know, the economy in Spain is not particularly good, and one of the manifestations of that is that the, the universities have raised tuition rates three times in the six months leading up to this manifestation. And the students decided they'd had enough, and they decided they were going to hold a protest. I took this photograph from the, from the window of my hotel room, looking toward the entrance to Mobile World Congress. What the students realized was that 65,000 people come to this thing. This is a great time to hold a protest. Right? 10 a.m. on Tuesday morning, one student on a Blackberry sent a message that said, you know what, let's meet in front of Mobile World Congress at noon. Bring your friends. Two hours later, 25,000 people showed up in front of Mobile World Congress. It worked. How long does it take you to motivate 25,000 people to do anything? <laughs> We're a kind of a weird species. You know, technology, we love it, we want it. Sometimes the technology like, well, there's technology in this picture. This is Scottsdale, Scottsdale, Arizona, that says, you know what? We want to live here. We want five bars of service on our phones because, you know, we're wealthy upscale people, but, but we don't want to look at any antennas. You know, well, let me explain to you how radio works, okay? You know, you got to have an antenna. Well, so they, they, they bolted the cactus to the ground with the antenna inside of it, and, and life is good. <laughs> yeah, you notice, notice the roots, the steel roots on this thing? Okay. The message I want to leave you with is this. It's a very simple one. Technology plays a role in creativity, and as we look down the road and we start to see what's happening, we start to realize that this is, this is kind of a fundamental thing that we need to do, and I'm gonna challenge all of you to the following. Remember the leadership message I gave you? My message to you is this. If we can do this in the developing world, what can we do here, and why can't we? Here's the challenge I give to you, and I want you all to exercise in terms of a leadership responsibility, and that is, to go out there and challenge governments and challenge schools and challenge ourselves to recognize that we must reject the status quo we have today, that we must create a new status quo, that we must create a big, audacious, powerful vision, and that we must then execute on that vision. You know why? Because the kids that are going to be graduating from that new model deserve better than the one they have today. That's real leadership. And my challenge to you is to please execute it. Thank you very, very much.